Rocket engines are the heroes of every space exploration journey, serving as the propulsion force to propel spacecraft beyond Earth's atmosphere. Their significance lies in their ability to generate the immense thrust needed for liftoff and their precision and reliability throughout the mission. Therefore, having a powerful and efficient operating engine for their vehicles is crucial. SpaceX is a company that highly values this aspect. They've opted to build the most powerful engines for the largest rocket ever constructed, the Raptor engine for the Starship. However, achieving flawless operation for the Raptor, as designed by SpaceX, has not been entirely straightforward. Not to mention the hundreds of successful individual Raptor engine tests. Let's take a look at how 33 Raptor engines standing together performed in the recent third launch of the Starship. The launch and ascent phase of the mission demonstrated the remarkable capabilities of the Raptor engines. With a total of 33 Raptor 2 engines powering the Super Heavy booster, the launch sequence proceeded smoothly, culminating in a successful liftoff and ascent to the desired trajectory. The engines exhibited their raw power and efficiency, propelling the massive spacecraft through Earth's atmosphere and into the void of space with precision and reliability. However, despite the successful launch, challenges arose during the landing attempt of Booster 10. According to the timeline, at around T6 minutes and 46 seconds, the booster engines were supposed to reignite after the supersonic phase had to control the landing process. But we all witnessed this happening almost 10 seconds later. Additionally, only three engines, including one inner gimbal engine and two middle engines, reignited, but the two middle engines ceased operation shortly after. This indicates that the booster engines were not as stable as in the previous stage. During the planned enhanced landing burning mission, the booster speed remained at nearly 2,000 kilometers an hour, or 555 meters a second. After three engines were ignited, the speed reached about 1,200 kilometers an hour, or 333 meters a second. Even before losing a connection at an altitude below one kilometer, the booster speed was still up to 1,112 kilometers an hour or 308.9 meters a second. That's indeed a very high speed for a gentle landing. As a result, the booster exploded less than 500 meters from the sea level. It's unclear what the problem is with the engines, but we still have a myriad of reasons we can think of that could cause the engines to fail to reignite up again. Because rocket engines are highly complex, even minor issues can disrupt all previously set procedures. This development somewhat proves that the operation of Raptor engines specifically and rocket engines in general is not simple, especially during critical stages like landing. So, why are rocket engines so difficult to reignite like that? This varies greatly between engine types. As a general rule of thumb, the more complicated the rocket engine, the harder it is to relight. The only exception to this rule is solid rocket engines that can't be shut off in any practical way once they started going. First, it's essential to note that a rocket engine needs the same pressure going to the combustion chamber as there is leaving the combustion chamber through the nozzle, or the combusting gases will just flow back into the tanks, which you can probably guess is not optimal. This is where 95% of the complexity of rocket engines comes from. How do I get the fuel up to the right pressure in an efficient way? There are rocket engines that are extremely simple to start, as simple as turning a valve or two. These are pressure-fed monopropellant engines, typically used on reaction control systems for fine maneuvers in space. And they're so easy to start because they're nothing more than a pressurized tank or two, a valve, and a nozzle. Turn the valve, and the pressurized gas flows out, or generating thrust. They're called pressure-fed because the fuel's already at the same pressure inside the tank as there will be going in the nozzle, so you don't need any pumps. Pressure-fed engines can get more efficient if you pick fuels that can decompose, like hydrogen peroxide, and in turn, generate heat. In terms of complexity, it's still practically the same thing, just now with a combustion chamber between the valve and nozzle. If you want to get even more efficient, you can use bipropellant engines that take advantage of a property of hypergolic fuels. Essentially, a hypergolic mixture is a mix of two gases that instantly combust when they meet, meaning you don't need any igniters. Open the valve, the engine burns. It starts getting difficult when you leave the realm of pressure-fed engines. The problem is that pressure-fed engines are limited by how much pressure you can have in the tanks, which isn't a lot when you consider the tanks need to be as light as possible. The alternative is to use a pump to get the fuel up to pressure. This has been done in endless different ways throughout the history of spaceflight and is overwhelmingly the most expensive part of an engine to develop every single time. It's also the reason why most rocket engines are so hard to start. The difficulty is there, but the human brain is infinite and engineers still have methods to restart the engine when landing or in vacuum conditions. According to Everyday Astronaut, a famous YouTuber in the aerospace industry, one of the most common methods essentially uses spark plugs. Take a high voltage and give it a jump, providing the perfect opportunity to ignite ionized fuel propellant using electrical energy. 
However, this method demands substantial electrical energy, necessitating heavy batteries or ground support equipment during startup. Another method similar to spark plugs resembling the automotive industry with diesel engines is using glow plugs. Glow plugs require significant electricity to generate heat for initiating combustion. Next is using a laser beam. Lasers can precisely focus energy beams to stimulate propellant fuel molecules, potentially offering more efficient operation. Although not very common, Airbus has developed some optical ignition options for certain propulsion rockets. While these methods are effective, they all require a significant amount of electric power, often stored in large batteries. That's why it's not a favored method by major players in the industry. Most of them tend to focus on chemical reactions to initiate the ignition process. If you've watched a Falcon 9 or Heavy launch, you might have noticed a greenish light when the ignition starts. This is caused by the liquid igniter self-combusting upon contact with oxygen to initiate stable combustion. SpaceX utilizes a liquid igniter called TEA-TEB, or triethyl aluminum triethyl borane, stored in their own dedicated boxes on the rocket, enabling multiple restarts of their Merlin engines. Now, not every engine is connected to the T-TEB box, only engines slated for reignition, namely three out of nine Merlin engines on the booster stage and the vacuum Merlin engine on the upper stage. For the Raptor engines, SpaceX has implemented a combined method called torch igniters. The torch igniter is essentially a fancy version of a lighter to light a candle. It's called the Advanced Ignition Spark System, or AIS. AIS has a small electric spark ignition system followed by a separate supply of methyl ox to fuel the spark torch. So in essence, it's akin to a miniature flamethrower initially ignited by an electric spark. Then, that flame continues throughout the remainder of the ignition sequence. So it's akin to the staged ignition effect of solid rocket boosters using a smaller electric spark ignition source to ignite a small flamethrower device. However, this method's only implemented on the booster stage, and in fact, the Raptor engine lacks an ignition component in its main combustion chamber. So, how does it manage to ignite? To be honest, Elon Musk has remained tight-lipped about the exact method they used to bypass ignition in the main combustion chamber. However, it's believed that SpaceX is bypassing the uniform burning process or essentially allowing self-ignition as methane and oxygen come in contact with each other. The key factor enabling this bypass is the full-flow combustion cycle employed by Raptors. Here, both the fuel and oxidizer undergo pre-combustion in their respective pre-burners before entering the main combustion chamber as already heated gas. Therefore, it's the interaction between these gases, coupled with the exceptionally high pressure within the combustion chamber, that obviates the need for an ignition source. As a result, the propellant is inherently hot, volatile, and prime for combustion. However, there still seems to be some instability with the engines, which is why Raptor demonstrated a mistake during its third launch attempt. This serves as a significant learning experience for them to thoroughly evaluate the Raptor engine system and implement improvement plans swiftly in the future. This included enhancements to the engine relighting process, as well as improvements in overall performance and reliability. By addressing these issues directly, SpaceX aims to ensure safer and more successful landings for the next missions, minimizing risks and optimizing the performance of the Raptor engines in all stages of flight. That's all for today's episode. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.